This story opens on incongruity, a child and destruction. There is a gap in what we are being shown. This little girl is acting almost too much like a normal little girl, as if this absolute devastation around her doesn't even exist. Listen to this music. A burnt out shell of someone's house is not what we expect to see with twinkly fairy tale music box music. And zooming out conceptually here a bit, and this is the most brilliant element of this entire short, we also cannot make up our minds whether or not to be horrified by the facts of what we're seeing, a child in a burning home, or in awe of the beauty of it. This art style is mind blowing in how absolutely drop dead gorgeous it is, and yet it's painting a picture of tragedy. And to zoom in again just a bit, the use of darkness of shadows makes us feel like we're missing something, which is already the feeling of the scene. We the audience we're trying to figure out what's going on here. We feel like we're in the dark here narratively, there are gaps in our knowledge here. And also the motion of the animation, I don't know if it's actually the frame rate, but this kind of choppiness. It's practical, yes, but it's also directed at evoking the same feeling of a gap of things not exactly connecting. Between all these elements here, it's an ingeniously intricate subconscious backdrop to what the story is all about, which is this girl who represents a paradox. Something fascinating I found in the backstory of the short, the making of it. Initially, they weren't sure if they could make an entire short about this particular champion. She wasn't a major character in the League of Legends world, she didn't seem compelling enough to be protagonist of an entire narrative, and what she was was pretty simplistic. She was an evil girl and that's it. That statement is fascinating to me, because within those words you can see an entire creative process in how it unfolded. Evil and girl. There's a tension there. We see this trope of the evil child so often now in stories that we can easily forget just how bizarre it is in concept. Evil we think of power, at least some minimum threshold of power to impact your environment somehow, and little kids can't even blow their own nose. How can a little kid be evil? And also, children are like the most morally innocent creatures ever. When does little Susie have time to go down that dark scary road towards corruption and villainhood? So here's two characteristics, a little girl and evil, that don't belong together, that we don't even quite believe is possible. It's a paradox, can this really exist? And that is the tension this entire short is built around. Every scene, every frame practically, and that's why I really want to go through in detail here scene by scene and show how literally every moment and every aspect of the storytelling is all directed at making us strongly feel that paradox. We are pulled in one direction, this is a little girl, just a normal little girl, and then we're pulled the other way, no this is a monster. Back and forth over and over at every level and the story lives and breathes in that confusion. And it starts before we even get to the story, just looking at the character, the design, Annie is an extremely normal looking little girl. She's not dressed in fancy clothes, no fancy hair, no fancy name, no fancy jewelry, no face tats, no machine gun limbs. She's just a little girl, she has little girl things like a teddy bear, she makes little girl drawings. Except, wait a minute, there's that incongruity again, there's that gap. Wait, is this, is she? Nope. Cut to normal little girl stuff again, playing with toys, laughing. Look at this transition again, this is so interesting to me. Often when you see a story built around tension, it's for the most part about building that tension and never really letting you escape from it until a big cathartic moment at the end. This transition is a stark, abrupt release of tension. Just when we start worrying that maybe this little girl with the crayon drawings is something more sinister than a normal little girl when we feel that pull, abrupt release of tension. And we're in the bedroom playing with toys and laughing, and it happens again right after this. We get another hint of something darker. No, he's mine! Is this when we're gonna see the inner mont- oh wait, never mind. The music is getting all warm and fuzzy, the camera is moving away, it's disengaging from the scene, that means nothing is gonna happen, we're done here, we're about to move on. Oh sh- never mind, there it is. We were immersed in normal little girl mode, and now for the first time we are face to face with the monster. And suddenly, a vital moment, how is Annie gonna react to this? Is she gonna react like a normal little girl, or oh no, she's reacting like an evil little girl? Oh shit, she's faking emotion, she's a sociopath. I knew it, she's a monster. Okay, how is this gonna resolve? What happens now? Nothing. Another peaceful dissolution of tension. Nothing happened after this. Did you think her dad was being naive here? You'll be playing together before you know it. Well, silly you, because he was right. We're back to playing, it's like both girls forgot it even happened. And seeing this, seeing Annie be a normal little girl again, it's making us question that earlier judgment. This is the monster? Did I really think that? And then, not only is she not being a monster, we're quickly brought to a moment of her being completely virtuous. Her sister is the idiot here, chasing a butterfly into a river. Annie is trying to stop her, which is a good thing to do. Then when Daisy falls, Annie's trying her best to help her, to rescue her. This kid, is this the same one I thought was a monster just two seconds ago? Panda, llama, penguin, reindeer, hippo, ocelot. This moment of her trying to save her sister, the raging river swallowing her up. Think about what's going on here. Water and fire. Okay, it's been long enough. What just happened? Why did I do that? I was demonstrating this fascinating technique the short does with transitions. I'm talking about this, and this, and this. The scenes of the story are framed by transitions that make the whole thing feel like a dream. Every time we dissolve tension and have a switch from one side of the coin to the other, this dreamlike framing makes the previous events fade away in our minds like they didn't even happen. This kid has a good heart, look at her trying to help. But what about this? You just saw... 
did I? What was that again? Was that really relevant? Her mom was horrified by her. This girl seems to have burned her house down. Is that really what I just saw? It feels so distant from what I'm looking at right now. And by the way, all these scenes can absolutely be interpreted both ways. We don't see any burning her house down actively. We see her lying there like a victim. We don't see her flaming on maliciously. It's the equivalent of a little kid getting into a fight at school. The kid's not a monster. This wasn't on purpose. It's just what happens. Same thing here, clearly. Or she burned down her house. She is a cold monster who doesn't feel guilt for hurting her sister and fakes human emotion when it's convenient. And even this, by the way, maybe she does have a good side, but this is the inner monster coming out unconsciously. Or monster? I mean, think about the reality of what this kid went through. It's terrible. She lost her mother or maybe killed her, but lost her either way. And Mr. Tibbers is all she has left. And it's belittled by her new family. Daisy is constantly encroaching on this one boundary, this one thing Annie cares about. She hates that. It's very natural to feel aggression when she feels threatened like this, when someone is trying to take away her mother's love. And here it's unconsciously, but still it's being pulled away. Let me draw your attention to something else here. Look at how these characters are drawn. When I was at Weta Workshop talking to Warren, aka the effects guy who did these scenes, he was working on some animatronics and I asked him this question. What would you say is the biggest uh, like factor in making animatronics look real, making the motion look real, relatable? Oh wow, well, uh, the eyes, always the eyes. eyes. In the uh -huh. 80s, every eye mechanism was just hemispherical, clamshell, a lot of space. Uh -huh. Uh, nowadays, well, you have to get very close. One of the things I've done with this guy is uh, pull your arms to look sideways here. And well, also the irises are sculpted. But there's wetness, there's a meniscus. It's all those things that really show you know, just how that works. If you want your audience to connect and identify with what they're being shown on the screen, it's all about enriching the emotional story that is told through the eyes. The eyes in Annie Origins really are windows to the soul here. We see all the emotion there, all the humanity, except in one set of eyes. Very intentionally, and this is probably a decision by the original designers of the character, but no giant anime eyes for the bear. We want that window to be shut. We want you to feel identification with everyone, to feel connection with everyone, except for the bear. The bear is a black box. The bear is another gap in our knowledge, something we feel like is missing. We don't really understand this, and that makes us suspicious of it. Back to the story, Daisy dies, her mom is understandably really sad, and says, Your daughter's a monster. And here, Annie's reactions feel completely genuine. This is very clearly not a girl faking emotion like we saw before, which to be honest, all little kids do in these little meaningless situations. Every kid scrapes their knee and doesn't cry until they notice their parents watching them. See what's going on here again? See how I'm backpedaling, rationalizing? And speaking of confusion, here we get the added confusion of it actually not being Annie's fault at all. You can probably blame Annie for the first incident we saw, but here she was trying to help. As dire as the consequences were, this should not be the one incident that proves she's a monster. And this is actually a mirror of a technique they've been using with her mom. Your average mother loves her child more than anything. If we see a mother behaving outside that expectation, if we see a mother being this suspicious of her child, being this accusatory, calling her own child an evil monster, in 99.9% .9 of cases, the mom is in the wrong. Clearly. Here, it's warranted, and that's confusing. Because all signs from our life experience superficially point to one judgment, and we have to ignore all that because we know this is that 0.001% chance this is different. And it's the same for the dad, by the way. 99% of the time, a good dad defends his daughter and supports her and loves her no matter what. It's hard to see this loving relationship and know that it's not exactly warranted here. The dad is being blind to something, and that's what the love is standing on. It's confusing to see that, and it's full of that juicy tension the story is built on. So Annie lights everything on fire, and the the dead dies, and we get this beautiful shot. Oops, we get this beautiful shot. And again, the dreamlike dissolve back to the opening sequence. And again, since here we're seeing the results of monster Annie, that's contrasted with actual Annie, who once again is normal little girl Annie. Here we see the most gentle, delicate, emotional version of this character, and it's real emotions, very real. In my opinion, this one word is by far the most touching little moment of the entire story. <laughs> That no, it's so genuine. It's so not performative at all. It's heartbreaking. It's hard to believe this is anything but an innocent little girl. And then of course, immediately following her most human moment by far, we get her most monstrous moment by far. She is undoubtedly human little girl here and undoubtedly monster right here. And how does it end? Of course, it's like it didn't happen, like it's all a dream. She chooses the Mr. Tibbers chair, so to speak. And then a final incongruity, growth and destruction, beautiful devastation. Now it breeze past a few great things here. 
the non-verbal storytelling is off the charts, especially in the opening sequence and the scene with the drawings, so efficient at getting across context and backstory and conflict. The initial interaction with Daisy, so beautifully ambiguous. We can totally see this from Annie's perspective, the boundary breaking I mentioned before, but we can also see Daisy as just being a playful child here. Or maybe she's also understandably subconsciously bothered by her sister's boundaries. It's hard to have a friend who's constantly talking about this other friend they like better than you. The next big thing is the use of dramatic irony, which I'll define quickly. Dramatic irony is when we know something a character doesn't. Dramatic irony engages the viewer as an active participant in the story. It's that moment in the horror movie when we're shouting at the screen, no, don't go in there, don't open that door. Here, Annie herself, her dad, and her sister. Throughout the story, they act like nothing is different about Annie at all. Even after these flame on moments, it's like it didn't happen. There's no anticipation from the characters before it happens, even though we definitely anticipate it happening. And then once it does happen, we have the dad making excuses. We have Annie making excuses. He knows there's some fire thing going on. He calls her Firefly. But he dismisses any danger, any actual monstrousness. Dramatic irony is a perfect device for supporting that dreamlike confusion that's so central to the story. Next, we got the immense restraint here. The most interesting actual thing about this character is the tension between evil and little girl. But it is too easy to look at this and say, oh, the most interesting thing is monster fire bear, obviously. That's what people love about this character. You want to make a short, just show little girl going crazy with her monster fire bear? There's your story. Don't need any of this touchy-feely crap. It's just a fun character. Have fun with it. But note, we get a tiny drop and another tiny drop, and only at the end we get just enough of a glimpse to be satisfied. So let's sum up here by formulating all this analysis into discrete writing tips. Because not only is this a fantastic story, it's one of those stories that's very rich educationally, especially because it's in response to a specific challenge. Annie is just an evil girl, and that's it. From that to this, that's a lot of data to work with. So tip number one, find plurality. Annie is just the simplistic trope, can't do much with that. But what they found was this trope has two parts, evil and little girl. You cannot build a story out of one thing. One thing exists in a static state. Nothing happens with one thing, no narrative can occur. Two things, now we have room for interaction. We have a relationship we can explore. Boxer, no story there. Two boxers, okay, now we can build something. Tip number two, find tension. This isn't the only way to build a narrative, but this is what happens here. Once we have our two things, we see they're pulling at us from opposing directions. And that denotes a clear structure of events. X is winning the tug of war, then Y is winning, then X again. Oh, here comes Y. Tip number three, define your tension. Identify what characterizes your tension and the feelings associated with it. The most common type of tension is succeed or fail. Live or die, the story is pulling us from one side to the other and back again, etc. What characterizes that tension is good versus bad, the associated feelings, hopeful versus hopeless. But here we have a more interesting kind of tension, in my opinion. Normal little girl versus evil little girl, with the character of the familiarity and playfulness of childhood versus horror at this impossible abomination that shouldn't exist. Now that structure from earlier is getting more filled out emotionally. Tip number four, gaslight your audience. If tension is central to your story, use release of tension as a tool to create more tension. Nothing puts us more on edge like saying, hey, nothing to worry about. It was all a dream. Tip number five, play with familiar structures, a loving mother, a father who defends his daughter. Here we turn both of those upside down. We take advantage of expectations and use that as a vehicle to confuse the audience, which is our goal here. That is how it works in this particular story, but lots of ways of doing this. My absolute favorite example, parents going to a son's track meet. Very normal, we know how that goes, but not when it's a superhero family going to watch their son who has super speed and they're undercover. Take these mundane things we have mundane, straightforward expectations of, apply the filter of your unique story. Tip number six, use your tools, but more specifically, understand how many tools you have at your disposal. Let's look at just these opening shots. Little girl in burning house, the gap, the confusion with her reaction to it. That's the basic composition here, and that would have been enough. But to further emphasize all these elements, we have the beautifully incongruous art cell, the incongruous music box music, the incongruous mood of the scene, the serenity, the stillness of it, the choppy frame rate that makes us feel like we're missing something, the shadowy lighting that reflects our ignorance, the misleading positioning of her body, she looks like a victim here. So many tools to work with, and they use all of them here without crowding the story, without crowding the cup. Tip number seven, the final set, which we didn't talk about that much, eliminate all excess. Every moment of the story is about that tension, that tug of war. Too easy with origin stories to go into more unnecessary details that enrich this character you love. And that is why you're writing the story. You love this character, but that doesn't give you license to make the story into a vehicle to gush about anything you find interesting. Note, your story has a defined focus. Eliminate everything that doesn't contribute to that focus. And that includes what we talked about earlier with the restraint with the bear. This is by far my favorite League of Legends cinematic short. Probably one of my favorite pieces of short fiction ever in any medium. And yeah, it's super similar to Arcane. Same basic elements, same tension, same stakes, but totally different ways of going about it. Totally different tools and ways of using tools. Finding drastically different types of stories is fascinating to compare, but finding super similar stories just as interesting to me. Subscribe, let me know in the comments if you have lol shorts you really like, and let me know what you like about them.
them. What makes the shorts so compelling or meaningful to you? Support the channel on Patreon if you wish. Shout out to all the patrons, and especially new high tier patron Savannah Shire. Thanks so much to everyone for all the support. Hope you enjoyed this analysis, and thanks for watching.